Hello and welcome to Castles and Legends. Today we're in North Wales at the mighty Carnarvon Castle. The impressive Carnarvon Castle stands quite magnificently on the eastern shore of Amenai Strait and in the town of Carnarvon. This Edwardian masterpiece formed part of the Ring of Iron, a series of stone castles that circled northern Wales, built after Edward I's conquest of Wales. The first evidence of fortifications at Carnarvon comes from the Romans, who built the strategically placed fort of Sergontium, just on the eastern outskirts of the modern town. Founded in AD 77 by the Roman general Ogrocula, the fort acted as the administration centre for Anglesey, and evidence through the discovery of coins suggests that the Romans occupied Segontion until around AD 394. The Romans left Britain less than 20 years later, and not a lot is really known about the status of Carnarvon for the next 650 years. Not until the arrival of the Normans. William the Conqueror set his sights on establishing Norman rule over parts of Wales quite soon after the conquest of 1066 and it's mentioned in the Doomsday Book of 1086 that a lot of North Wales was already under the rule of the Norman Robert of Rudland. Robert was killed by the Welsh towards the end of the 11th century so his cousin Hugh de Arvrange, 1st Earl of Chester, was left to bolster Norman control in this area of Wales and went on to construct three castles. One was located at Aberthliniog in Anglesey and one was located somewhere in the region of Meirionnef, although the exact location is unknown, and another at Carnarvon. Hugh's castle at Carnarvon, which was established in around 1093, was placed right on the peninsula that was formed by the Menai Strait. The castle's design was that of a Mott and Bailey construction, a timber palisade and a large circular mound, which would likely have had a wooden keep built on the top of it. The location of the bailey is not clear, but the mound was incorporated into the eastern ward of the stone Edwardian castle that followed. The Welsh were able to take possession of Carnarvon Castle when they recaptured the Kingdom of Gwynedd in 1115. They held the castle until 1283, up until the point where the Welsh were defeated by Edward I. Through documents of the time, it is known that during the Welsh ownership of the castle, Llewellyn the Great and Llewellyn the Last both occasionally resided at Carnarvon. On the 22nd of March 1282, war broke out between the English, ruled by Edward I, and the Welsh led by Flewellyn ab Griffith, also known as Flewellyn the Last. Flewellyn was killed in December of that year, and his brother Dafif continued the fight, but Edward was making significant progress, capturing castles as he marched through northern Wales. Edward went on to capture Dolbadarn Castle in May 1283, the last castle held by Dafif. This marked victory for the English, and the end of the war. Edward knew that in order to maintain his victory and rule over the Welsh, he needed something that could quickly squash any kind of rebellion or uprising. He laid out a plan of building what is now known as the Ring of Iron, a series of castles that would surround North Wales. He started the construction of a castle at Conway which was then soon followed by two more castles at Harlech and Carnarvon. All three of them were built quickly, simultaneously and at a scale that dwarfed the recent castles built at Rivlin and Flint, and all three of them were designed and overseen by the master of military architecture, James of St George of Eastern France. The first recorded construction entry for Carnarvon was on the 24th of June 1283 which details work being done on a new ditch that would separate the castle from the streets and buildings of the town to the north. This was followed up by the construction of a barricade, which would surround and protect the construction site while the permanent defences were being built. 
The views up here from the top of the battlements are really rather spectacular. And I think we can get up even a little bit higher to the top of these little turrets. Timber for the castle came from as far as Liverpool and stone was quarried from the local area. Hundreds of workers would have been brought in to dig out the moat and foundations. And as the construction site got bigger and encroached into the town, houses that stood in the way were demolished, with residents of them not receiving any sort of compensation until three years later. Edward and his queen, Eleanor of Castile, arrived from Conwy to stay at the castle in mid-July 1283. Construction of the castle had only really been going on for a month, so the castle was nowhere near close to being able to accommodate anyone. They needed somewhere to stay, so accommodation in the form of temporary timber apartments were built, and they stayed for over a month. Carnarvon became the new administrative centre of Gwynedd after the Statute of Rivlin was enacted in 1284, which essentially introduced English common law to Wales. The title Prince of Wales had historically been a symbol of power as well as a protectorate to the Welsh people. Edward knew this, and after his conquest of Wales he wanted another son. On the 25th of April 1284, while staying at Carnarvon for the second time, Eleanor gave birth to their son, Edward II. Legend has it that in order to win over the Welsh, Edward had promised them that the next Prince of Wales would be Welsh and he presented them with his Welsh-born son. Most of Edward's previous children had passed away by this point and four months after Edward II's birth, Alfonso, the oldest son and heir to the English throne, also passed away, leaving Henry as heir. Henry II was formally given the title Prince of Wales in 1301. The castle was starting to take shape by 1285 and the town walls were complete. After a couple more years of high expenditure on the castle, spending and building work began to drop off from 1288 to the point of accounts ceasing altogether in 1292. Just behind me, is the Eagle Tower, the largest of the towers. It's three stories high and was intended for use for accommodation on a grand scale. At the top of the tower, we can see three turrets, which give it a really distinct and unique appearance. Within the castle, there is an abundance of passages, which allowed the garrison, which could be as few as 20 men, to easily move between the towers. The castle contained few large windows, but instead had many arrow slits, which would have made it very difficult for attackers, and the walls were up to 20 feet thick in places. In 1294, a Welsh rebellion broke out, led by Madoc Ab Llywelyn, a relative to the last recognised native Welsh prince. The English rulers had imposed new taxes which enraged the Welsh, and after months of planning, a number of castles were attacked throughout Wales. Carnarvon, being a symbol of English power, was a target which Madoc and his forces overran and captured. The town walls were badly damaged, anything in the town that could be burned was set on fire, and the castle, being incomplete, was easily captured. Edward ordered an immediate counter-attack in the winter of 1294, and by the summer of 1295, the English took back Carnarvon and started to refortify the town. The town walls were rebuilt as a priority, and once complete, focus then shifted to the incomplete castle, which had seen no work done for three years. Payments ceased to be recorded by 1330, and the state of the castle at this point is pretty much what stands today. Despite the vast sums of money spent, estimated to be between 20 and 25,000 pounds, the castle was left unfinished. The backs of the King's Gate and Queen's Gate were never completed, and foundations inside the castle suggest other buildings were planned. 
The political arrangements established by Edward I after the conquest of Wales remained in place for the next 200 years, and Carnarvon continued to be garrisoned throughout this period. Relations between the Welsh and their English conquerors began to strain, with the Welsh becoming frustrated as many of the important administrative jobs in Wales were being given to the English. At the start of the 15th century, tensions erupted into a Welsh revolt led by Owain Glendower. Carnarvon was first sieged in 1401, but the English successfully fended off this attack. In 1403, Glendower and his Welsh forces attacked the castle for a second time, but this time with the aid of French allies. The attackers brought a number of different types of siege engine with them, but the walls being so tall and thick, they had no effect. The only type of siege engine that could have turned the tide would have been a large trebuchet, which the attackers didn't have. It is recorded that the garrison was defended by just 28 men and once again successfully defended the castle. With two failed attacks thwarted by a small garrison, we really get a glimpse of how near impossible it was to break Carnarvon Castle. When the Tudor family became the ruling house of England and Wales in 1485, change was established in the way Wales was ruled. The Tudor family originated from Wales, which helped the hostilities between the Welsh and English. With subdued hostilities, the need for impressive fortifications soon diminished and Carnarvon Castle, along with others, became neglected and by 1538 it was recorded as ruinous. Parts of the castle that would naturally require maintenance deteriorated, timbers became rotten and many of the roofs fell in, with just the Eagle Tower and the King's Gates roofs still in place by 1620. The contents of the castle's buildings were gutted, leaving nothing of value, but the castle and town walls remained in extremely good condition, so its primary purpose of being a formidable fortification remained intact. During the English Civil War of 1642-48, the castle was occupied by a royalist garrison. Through the course of the war, the castle was besieged three times, and eventually the constable, John Byron, the first Baron Byron, surrendered the castle to parliamentarian forces in 1646. This would be the last time Carnarvon would see any action, and soon after, in 1660, an order from the parliamentarians was made to dismantle the walls to stop the castle from being used again for military purposes. This fate, known as slighting, sadly befell many castles across Wales and England at the time. Miraculously though, Carnarvon Castle managed to escape this doom, as very little was taken down, if the work was ever started. Although the castle was able to avoid demolition, it wasn't able to avoid further neglect which continued into the 19th century. Eventually, the government began to fund repairs to Carnarvon Castle from the 1870s under the direction of Deputy Constable Llewellyn Turner. Roof steps and battlements were restored and repairs were made to the Chamberlain Tower. Much of what we see today owes much to the determination of Turner. In 1911, the investiture of Edward, Prince of Wales, was held at Carnarvon, which was the first to take place in Wales for centuries. The ceremony was held again there in 1969 for Charles, Prince of Wales, who is now King Charles III. The castle and town walls of Carnarvon, along with Beaumaris and Harlech Castle, and the castle and town walls of Conwy, form the UNESCO designated Castles and Town Walls of King Edward in Gwynedd World Heritage Site, being the finest examples of late 13th century and early 14th century military architecture in Europe. Carnarvon Castle is open to the public and is managed by CADU, the Welsh Government's Historic Environment Service. In 2023, 
a massive 5 million conservation project was completed, which opened up parts of the castle that had previously been inaccessible. Wow, just wow, what a magnificent castle. Carnarvon is definitely now one of my favourite castles. If you're ever in North Wales, this is a must-see. I really hope you have enjoyed exploring with us and learning about its rich history. If you have, then please give us a like and subscribe if you've not already. If you want to hear about a few of the ghosts that apparently reside here, then stick around. But I hope you've enjoyed the video and I hope to see you again on our next castle adventure. Bye for now. For centuries, there have been sightings reported of a ghost called the Floating Lady. We don't know who this mysterious person is, or what her connection to the castle might be, but regularly people have seen her floating through the castle and down corridors. It has also been reported that electrical equipment has been affected, with items being tampered with and lights flickering on and off. Legend has it that Queen Eleanor's ghost occasionally manifests within Carnarvon. As the wife of King Edward I, she wielded significant influence in medieval England. Witnesses claim to have seen her ghost pacing the castle battlements and strolling through the courtyard. One tale suggests her spirit is unable to find peace possibly due to lingering worries about a ransom paid for the town. Alternatively, some attribute eerie sounds of weeping near the castle's king's gate to her presence. The haunting presence of Queen Eleanor only enhanced the allure of this grand castle. <laughs>